And this is a, a genuinely hot topic, I think, uh, minimally invasive surfactant. We're going to go through the basics, first of all, the respiratory problems of, of prematurity. And uh, I think you all know this. It's all about surfactant deficiency and how that leads to low lung volumes and airway collapse. Leads to epithelial damage as the lung collapses and then reopens. And as, the, as it reopens, protein leaks into the alveoli and inactivates any surfactant that's present. The breathing problems of, of preterm babies start with achieving and maintaining a functional residual capacity, keeping the lungs open at the end of expiration. These babies need to clear lung fluid. They have very floppy uh, airways that tend to collapse. They also have a very flexible chest wall, which doesn't help them with their spontaneous breathing efforts. And on top of that, they have an immature respiratory drive that leads to apnea. And the natural history of respiratory distress syndrome is a gradually increasing work of breathing, leading to hypoxia and acidosis, and many babies untreated will die. Two treatments we have to, to help with respiratory distress syndrome, surfactant therapy and CPAP. We'll talk a little bit about the physiology of both. Surfactant, as you know, is a lipoprotein complex produced by the top type 2 alveolar cells. It reduces surface tension, improves lung compliance, and prevents atelectasis. Surfactant deficiency is the major problem with neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. And we all know that the surfactant therapy is very effective. It's one of the great joys of our lives to give surfactant and see the baby improve almost on the end of our syringe. CPAP also has a strong biological rationale to help these babies. It increases their pharyngeal cross-sectional area. It stabilizes those floppy airways, decreases upper airway obstruction, and therefore reduces obstructive apnea. It also helps maintain that functional residual capacity. By keeping the airways open and dilated, it re reduces resistance and the work of breathing associated with that resistance. By keeping the alveoli open, it improves ventilation perfusion mismatch and therefore enhances oxygenation. And by stopping that collapse and reinflation cycle, it prevents uh, inflammatory mediators getting into the alveoli and therefore conserves surfactant. All treatments have a downside, and a, a very well-known one of CPAP is air leak, particularly pneumothorax. There's a theoretical concern that if the pressures are too high, this causes uh, over-distension of the lungs, impaired venous return, and decreased cardiac output. And of course, we've all seen gastric distension as a result of uh, CPAP. We turn to uh, evidence from randomized trials. First, ask the question, when should we give surfactant? And turning to a couple of Cochrane reviews, the first compares early and delayed selective surfactant treatment. And the, the answer is, is clear. If, if uh, you're giving surfactant um, to babies with an endotracheal tube, you should give it early. That will save lives. More than 3,500 babies in, involved in this pooled analysis and a clear benefit to uh, giving early rather than delayed surfactant. These are very consistent results across a number of trials. Similar picture for the outcome of death or BPD. Again, more than 3,000 babies and a statistically significant benefit to giving surfactant early. And just to remind you, this is a message to do with intubated infants. If you put an endotracheal tube down, then follow it quickly with, it, with surfactant uh, and for these randomized trials, that was within two hours. The next, uh, the next systematic review frames the question slightly differently. It's prophylactic versus selective use of surfactant in preventing morbidity and mortality in preterm infants. And here we've got a large number of trials, more than, more than 4,000 babies. But I'd like to draw your attention to this little figure down the bottom here. That's the I squared statistic. It's 92%. This tells us that the results of this pooled analysis are quite inconsistent. There's a lot of heterogeneity present. 
And while overall, after more than four and a half thousand babies, there is no clear distinction, although the, the, um, the uh, pooled analysis favours prophylactic uh, therapy, it doesn't quite cross the line of no effect. The trials divide themselves neatly into two sets. The first is the trials that had no routine CPAP. These were conducted in the 1990s and showed a clear benefit to the use of prophylactic over selective surfactant. A clear benefit of relative risk of about a third reduction in the rate of mortality. In the 2000s, when CPAP was given routinely, the uh, direction of effect is in the opposite direction and favours selective surfactant. So there's some messages here that are quite interesting. In the early trials, um, for infants at risk of RDS, prophylactic surfactant decreases air leak and mortality. The later trials, treated in our more modern way, where there was a, a high rates of antenatal steroids, and routine stabilisation of these babies on CPAP, there was less chronic lung disease or death with early CPAP and selective surfactant. So there's a tension here. Conventionally, to administer surfactant, we need to have an endotracheal tube with its attendant risks. And there are alternatives, and we'll come back to those shortly. So if we, if we look at endotracheal intubation, we, we as neonatologists love to endotracheally intubate babies. It's, it's what we do best. It's what separates us from other lesser mortals. But we must admit endotracheal intubation has associated problems. It's associated with acute and chronic lung, lung damage due to volume trauma when we ventilate these babies. It, it's associated with local airway damage. Uh, and in its most severe form, that can lead to subglottic stenosis. And in our immunocompromised hosts, a foreign body like an endotracheal tube is associated with infections, both pulmonary and systemic. So the alternative to putting an endotracheal tube as soon as the baby is born, which we did for many decades, is to start CPAP in the delivery room. And there have been a number of trials that have looked at this uh, question comparing management with CPAP to early intubation. And we started the ball rolling with the COIN trial, which uh, was an international multi-centre randomised trial, enrolled more than 600 babies between 25 and 28 weeks gestation. And we randomised these babies in the first five minutes after birth to either receive CPAP or be intubated. And the primary outcome was death or BPD. So the results of this, uh, of this study were that half of the babies randomised to CPAP were never ventilated. Those babies tended to have less BPD at 36 weeks and they spent less time on an endotracheal tube. However, they did get more pneumothoraces. Other major neonatal morbidities, no significant differences. So at the end of the COIN trial, we felt that for, for these babies who breathed at birth but needed respiratory support, management with CPAP seemed to improve outcomes compared with those ventilated from birth. George Smoltzer put together all of the uh, relevant trials comparing CPAP and immediate intubation and found a, a, a fairly clear-cut result. Babies managed with CPAP had a reduced rate of death or BPD compared to those who were intubated. And this is almost 3,000 babies. It's not a huge effect. It's about a 9% relative risk reduction, but it's a clinically important reduction. The American Academy has looked at the results of these studies and come up with a number of recommendations. And they agree that early use of CPAP with subsequent selective surfactant administration in extremely preterm infants results in lower rates of death and BPD when compared with treatment with prophylactic or early surfactant therapy. And that's a high level of evidence. The worry always was that if we delayed surfactant, these babies would come to harm. But their conclusions were that preterm babies treated with early CPAP are not at increased risk of adverse outcomes if treatment with surfactant is delayed or not given. So what should we do? Intubate these babies? and give them early surfactant or start them on early CPAP. 
the people have tried to do both. Um, can we give surfactant to babies on CPAP? Well, yes, we can. We can briefly intubate them, give the surfactant, and then remove the endotracheal tube, the insure procedure. And that is practiced widely in some uh, NICUs. There is a disadvantage to that uh, approach in that these babies should be sedated. And sometimes having intubated them and sedated them, we have difficulty uh, getting the endotracheal tube out. Can we give surfactant to babies on CPAP without intubating them? Well, this, this is, gives rise to the idea of minimally invasive surfactant therapy. So deliver surfactant to a spontaneously breathing baby who then continues on nasal CPAP. And you can do that in a number of ways. Uh, you can give it to the baby, inject it into the back of their throat soon after birth, nasopharyngeal installation, and John Catwinkle reported this uh, almost 20 years ago. It hasn't really caught on. More recently, people have tried giving surfactant through a, a laryngeal mask, uh, and that is gaining some popularity, but again, not widely used. Aerosolization sounds like a, a great idea if we can just uh, administer the, um, the surfactant through an aerosolizer uh, to spontaneously breathing babies. That would be wonderful, but there have been problems getting the particle size right and proving effectiveness. And again, this is a technique that hasn't really taken off as yet which leaves the uh, fourth possibility of tracheal catheterization. And so the pioneers of, of this way of doing things were the German group led by Angela Cribbs. Uh, and this is their randomized trial, now 10 years old. Uh, they compared um, an intervention group where they passed a catheter and then some surfactant into the babies versus standard treatment. They showed that these babies had less ventilation in the first two to three days of life. An accompanying editorial said, you haven't studied enough babies. We need more information before we can recommend this in general practice. And that led us to undertake a, a randomized trial of minimally invasive surfactant therapy in preterm babies with respiratory sy distress syndrome. And this was led by Peter Dargaval, my friend and colleague from Tasmania. So the background to the Optimist trial uh, was that, that meta-analysis by George Smolzer that, that showed this small but important reduction in death or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. But we noted that the trial thresholds for intubation in the CPAP arm were relatively high. They varied between 40% and 60% oxygen. So the question arises, could the a benefit of initial CPAP have been accentuated? Could we've got even better results if, this, if surfactant had been administered selectively at a lower oxygen concentration to babies exhibiting early features of RDS? And so, as I've mentioned, the, uh, you can do that uh, in the German way. And the way they do it is use a feeding tube, which is fairly floppy, flexible. And to get that through the cords, the vocal cords, you need McGill's forceps to guide the catheter through before giving the surfactant. Our method, the Hobart method, uses a semi-rigid catheter. And I'll show you a video of that in a minute. And that uh, alleviates the need to use McGill's forceps. So just to share with you this video of how we do it. So this is the catheter. It's a, it's a vascular catheter, an angiocat size 16. It's relatively rigid, and, but you, and you can put a little bend in it to mimic this, the, uh, the bend in an endotracheal tube. So visualize the cords with the, uh, using a laryngoscope. If you've got a competent neonatal fellow, they'll put the catheter in first time very quickly. The baby remains on CPAP throughout the whole procedure. Surfactant is added to, uh, attached to the catheter and injected in three or four boluses. We're trying to synchronize those with the baby's breathing, but that's, uh, that's quite difficult. We do our best. Baby keeps breathing uh, throughout the procedure. We expect to see a little bit of reflux back up through the vocal cords. And then once the surfactant is, is uh, delivered, catheter removed, the baby remains on CPAP. 
So in a PICO formulation, the, the methodology of our trial, we were asking the question in the population of preterm babies, 25 to 28 weeks gestation, managed on CPAP with signs of RDS. The uh, treatment we're looking at is minimally invasive surfactant treatment as given in that video, Compa comparing that with continuation of CPAP as a control group, and our primary outcome was death or bronchopulmonary dysplasia at 36 weeks post-menstrual age. So this is, uh, this is a difficult trial to, to run. You have to screen the whole population of, of preterm babies in that gestational age window. And they had to meet these inclusion criteria. They needed to have CPAP. They needed to be up between five and eight centimetres of water and in at least 30% of oxygen in the first six hours of life. We excluded babies who needed immediate intubation or had some other cause of for their respiratory distress, like sepsis, babies with congenital anomaly, or if the treatment team were not available when the baby needed treatment. We needed uh, prospective consent. And we tried to blind this study by uh, assembling a treatment team of, of staff that weren't involved in the baby's care. And that comprised of somebody who could uh, administer the, the uh, mist. And so it's a, an interesting technique, but usually if you can intubate a baby with an endotracheal tube, you can intubate a baby with a catheter. That was usually a neonatologist or a senior fellow, occasionally a nurse practitioner or a respiratory therapist, and to assist them, uh, a neonatal nurse. Randomization was performed by the treatment team. It was web-based randomization to either the MIST or control group, and the babies were stratified by gestation and study center. So blinding was achieved by screening off the bed space, drawing curtains around the babies, uh, disconnecting any central monitors and putting on a study oximeter so that we could keep track of the heart rate and, and uh, oxygen saturation throughout the procedure. The control group had a sham treatment. So the baby behind the curtains was repositioned as though it was going to have a laryngoscopy. It didn't receive that, obviously. Um, the treatment team tried to mimic the orders and responses and the noises uh, that they would generate as they would for the mist group. So suction, please, that sort of thing. The intervention for the mist group, uh, pre-medication was only with oral sucrose and uh, intravenous atropin to avoid bradycardia. The surfactant was given uh, in the way I showed you with that 16 gauge vascular catheter. Um, or later in the, in the trial, we had access to a purpose built uh, Lisa cath. Um, this was placed at least one and a half centimeters through the vocal cords for our tiniest babies or two centimeters for the bigger babies was inserted, as you saw, under direct vision, 200 milligrams per kilo or 2.5 mils per kilo of uh, Curaserf was administered in three to four aliquots, baby maintained on CPAP throughout. There's some animal work that suggests that having the baby inhale the, the surfactant, draw the surfactant into its own lungs, gives better distribution than forcing the surfactant in on a ventilator. Of course, if, if babies became apneic or hypoxic or bradycardic, they would be uh, resuscitated with a um, mask ventilation. After the intervention, babies put back to their original position, standard monitoring started again, and the care was handed over to the bedside staff. And then we surveyed uh, people who were outside the curtain to see if they could tell which treatment was given. After the, the curtain was, was opened up, the uh, clinical team were instructed to manage them in this way. If the oxygen requirement went above 45%, as was conventional uh, practice outside the trial, these babies would be intubated and given surfactant, or if they were having severe apnea or persistent acidosis. Other management, uh, the, the type CPAP could be increased up to a level of eight centimetres of water, and we allowed nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation. Primary outcome was BPD, as defined by the WASH criteria, babies on respiratory support or failing an air test at 36 weeks uh, post-menstrual age. The key uh, clinical and safety outcomes, these included a pneumothorax requiring drainage, 
the need for intubation in that first 72 hours of life, severe intraventricular hemorrhage, either grade three or four, a composite of death during hospitalization or major morbidity, death or major morbidity, and that was defined as severe IVH, cystic perioventricular leukomalacia, retinopathy of prematurity, uh, grade three or greater, or BPD. So we'll present the results uh, in terms of uh, relative risks um, with mean or median differences. Generalized linear modeling was used uh, in the analysis and we did some subgroup analyses based on gestation strata, oxygen requirement at, at study entry and geographic region. We calculated we'd need slightly more than 600 babies to give us 90% power to detect the one third reduction in death for BPD. Babies were recruited in 11 countries, 33 centres, and uh, we had an interim, uh, interim safety analysis conducted by an external monitoring committee who instructed us to continue enrolment. However, we had to stop in March of last year. We got to 80 percent of full recruitment, but we were just unable to recruit further babies because of the COVID ep epidemic. This brought our power down to 82 percent. Here's our consort diagram. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but uh, I'll draw your attention to the, the vast number of babies that were screened, more than 5,000 babies screened. We lost about half of them because they were intubated. They were too sick to go on the trial. And then there were another almost as many babies who didn't ever reach that 30% oxygen requirement in the first six hours of life. Most uh, families consented to, um, to uh, the trial, but a few uh, refused consent. And that brought us down to 488 babies enrolled. These are the, the babies uh, that I, I hope you would recognize uh, babies on average 27 weeks gestation, uh, 900 grams birth weight, roughly 50-50 split boys and girls, um, a reasonable proportion, but predominantly twins, about a third of our babies were twins. Two thirds of our babies had complete courses of steroids, high cesarean section rates, and babies enrolled quite early on in life, about three hours of age, on CPAP levels of around seven and then 35% oxygen. There were some imbalances in our gestational age strata. So we had the uh, more immature babies, 25 to 26 weeks, and the more mature babies, 27 to 28 weeks. It just so happened by chance there were more boys in the control group, uh, fewer girls, uh, more multiples in the missed group, and uh, a lower rate of steroid dosage in the missed group. So some higher risk babies uh, fell into the missed group in the smaller gestational age strata. Here's the primary outcome of the study. So death or BPD, the trend favours missed. Um, the, the relative risk is 0.87, but the whisker just crosses the line of no effect. The p-value is 0.088. For death, no significant difference, but a statistically significant reduction in physiological BPD, highly significant at P equals 0.01. So it gives a risk difference of 8%. So treat 12 babies with mist to prevent one case of BPD, a highly effective uh, treatment. Other important outcomes, there's almost a halving of the risk of pneumothorax in the MIST group, a big reduction in the need for intubation, non-significant uh, reductions in grade three or four IVH or death or major morbidity or morbidity overall, a trend uh, uh, towards increased death in the, in the MIST group um, was not statistically significant p-value from a three zero. Here's the performance of the babies with respect to intubation. You can see the control babies in blue were intubated more frequently during the first 24 hours, and that distant difference was maintained right through to 72 hours compared to the missed babies in orange. In the, uh, in the gestational age stratum, we found that the outcomes, death or BPD, 
and BPD were similar between the two strata. Um, the difference was in death. The, uh, the more mature babies seem to have a lower, the, the outcome favoured missed, whereas in the, in, uh, the control, in, the, um, in this lower gestational age strata, more missed babies died than control babies, so the outcome favoured control. Nothing statistically significant uh, there in the, either of the subgroups, however. A couple of highlighted secondary outcomes uh, require for, sec for surfactant via an endotracheal tube uh, halved in the missed group, less PDA requiring therapy, less intubation at any time, and a reduction in home oxygen therapy from 22% down to 15%, all of those results statistically significant. Some other respiratory outcomes, uh, decreased time on an endotracheal tube from four days to one day, and just uh, overall a reduction in days of all mechanical respiratory support from 45 to 40 days. Some uh, safety outcomes with respect to the missed procedure. Uh, it was thought that the, the trachea was successfully catheterized 100% of the time and only one attempt was required in three quarters of the, of the cases. About 10% of babies were thought to experience undue discomfort, bradycardia in about a third, hypoxia in about 40%, 14% uh, required some positive pressure inflations, but only one baby needed intubation at the time of the missed procedure. It was thought that about 12% of the time the treatment was ineffective. I suspect this, this may have been the catheter going down into the esophagus rather than the trachea. How well did we blind? Well, we're not sure, but uh, when we asked the staff outside the curtain what they thought had been given, a third said they were, they were correct in their guess. 10% uh, were incorrect. Most were unsure. So in summary, compared with the continuation of CPAP, the missed group showed no clear reduction in death or BPD, but an 8% absolute risk reduction in BPD in survivors. A halving in need for intubation in the first three days of life and a halving at the rate of pneumothorax. And some other benefits, uh, reduced PDA, uh, reduced duration of mechanical ventilation on an endotracheal tube, reduced duration of all forms of respiratory support, and less oxygen therapy required at home. So this is the largest randomised trial comparing surfactant delivery uh, via a thin catheter with any comparator. It's the only blinded study. We think that this technique of delivering uh, surfactant is widely applicable. The limitation, the, the main one, is the loss of power that we experienced when we stopped recruitment short of the original target. The incidence of the heart primary outcome and of death was higher than we anticipated. And we really need to follow these babies up into infancy to get an idea of what the long-term effects of this intervention are. But our conclusion is, and I think we're fairly confident about this, selective application of mist in preterm infants with RDS reduces the risk of BPD and other morbidities, lessens the burden of all forms of mechanical respiratory support. So I'm going to stop there thanking uh, if there's anybody in the audience who helped with this trial, thank you very much. It was, a, it was a big effort from around the world, but particularly I'd like to thank the babies and their families, and these are some of our babies uh, who have now grown up. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we'll take questions, I think, at the end of the session.